Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Writing Resumes Workshop. My name is Caitlin Hennessy, and I'm the Program Coordinator here at Global Connections. And our goal at Global Connections is to provide engaging extracurricular programming for online students anywhere they have an internet connection. Presenting tonight is Chris Miller. He is the Career Counselor for Global Campus, and he's also a Washington State University alum. And as many of you are already doing, please do use that chat box to discuss tonight's content. And you can also submit your own resume questions for Chris throughout the evening. If you do have any technical difficulties, please do let me know. I'll do my best to help you in the chat box. Or you can email me at connections or sorry, global.connections at wcu.edu. Once again, that email is global.connections at wcu.edu. I will pass it over to Chris. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you, everybody, for uh, hold on, there we go, and thank you, everybody. There it goes for um, showing up tonight. And as Caitlin said, we're here to talk about resumes and um, just use the chat box for any questions that pop up um, during the webinar, and I will cover those at the end. It, toward the um, uh, middle to end part here, we will have a little bit of an activity. Um, and so hopefully you have seen the, the mock posting and the um, four mock candidates for that job posting um, that we will kind of look at and determine who we think we would um, hire for that position or who we would interview. Um, and so if you haven't seen that, that's okay. I, I will take some time to go over it as well. And um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for being here. I always um, start off my, my webinars with a, a look at the career development process in general. Um, and I think this is a pretty decent snapshot of it from my point of view. Um, some of the, the four main uh, pro, uh, stages of this process are kind of self-evaluation, um, exploring options, career options, getting focused, uh, making a plan, and then uh, putting that plan into action, <coughs> taking action. So the topic tonight being resumes, I would say this is taking part in the know yourself and take action part. Because if you don't know yourself well and can't talk about your strengths and your interests, then it's really difficult to put a resume together. Um, and then, of course, taking action. This is one of the main tools uh, in the job search, as we all know. So a brief look at just the history and the reason for for these things called resumes. Um, obviously, it's a French word when I have it, you know, spelled correctly with the with the accents, which I never do. Um, it uh, means summary. Um, Leonardo da Vinci is credited as being the the first uh, person to use a resume. That's kind of just like a a fun little historical note. That's probably not true. I'm sure there were other uh, people around the same time and before that did something similar, because what it really was was a letter. Um, it was a letter that he sent to the Duke of Milan as he was traveling um, around Europe. He was sending letters to traveling um, or to nobility around Europe and kind of assessing um, their needs and kind of saying what he could do to help them with their problems. And um, it's kind of funny that, you know, today that is still like the right idea for a resume. Um, but often, over the course of time, it's been that 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 target concept has kind of been lost, where it's been more about these are all the things I've done, um, instead of you know what are your business problems and how can I help you solve them, which is really what is most likely, um, or I should say more likely to help people get hired or at least get an interview. Um, so throughout you know the next several or a few hundred years, they, that's kind of what a resume was. It was a letter, a description of a person, um, their abilities, and in some cases, their past employment. Until about the 1900s, early 20th century, things started to change. And in the, in the you know, up until the 1930s, a uh, resume was really more of a formality than a mandatory document. Um, things like weight, height, <laughs> religion, and marital status were commonplace for resumes. Of course, that is illegal uh, for a lot of things nowadays, for, for most employers. Um, and in the about the 1950s, uh, resumes started to become mandatory 
for uh, employment. And in the 1970s is kind of when things started to change with the digital age and um, you know, resumes started to look more professional and more like the presentation content you see today. Uh, in the 1980s, background checks became a lot easier to perform um, with the, you know, the, not the invention, but the popularity of the fax machine. People started doing more creative things like having VHS portfolios for employers. And of course now, everything is online. And talking about some misconceptions about a resume, even these uh, misconceptions I listed are a little, um, are a little deceptive because sometimes the resume is the first impression. And I think the misconception that I want to um, get across to you is that it sh it shouldn't be the first impression if you can help it. Um, you know, some employers put up barriers in order to prevent people from having that pre-contact. So a resume is the first impression. <clears throat> and so when that's the case, good, think of it that way. It's the first impression. How should I go about making sure it's the best first impression um, that's possible? Another old misconception. Um, oh, and so so what is that pre-contact? What is the what should that first impression be before I move on? It should be some kind of a networking piece ahead of time. Um, some contacts, some connecting on LinkedIn, a, an informational interview, something where you get your your name in front of a decision maker before you've submitted a resume that gives you a, a much greater chance of you know of them rec they see your resume they recognize you of getting an interview and so you know getting the interview of course is how you get the job so every job should be listed uh, that's not necessarily necessarily the case um, sometime sometimes an employer will ask that you provide every job that you've worked at, and in that case, you should do that. Um, but the idea is to prevent a cohesive theme um, that you know lists all the relevant work experience for that position. There's an old industry rule that there should be one page for every 10 years of experience. Um, that's not necessarily the case now. Um, it's definitely a, a point of contention for "Quote unquote resume professionals, so HR people, um, career counselors, career coaches. Uh, you know, really, most people can put together an effective one-page res resume, but you know, it's not necessary for all industries. And I recently attended a webinar for um, jobs uh, in the federal government. So they highlighted what a federal resume should look like. And for them, they said, totally ignore the one page rule. You know, give as many pages as you need in order to provide as much detail as you can that's relevant about your work experience. And they said, you know, we don't want a 20 page resume, but they're not opposed to seeing a good five page resume if it's all unique information. Um, it's, and like I said, it's the most important piece of your job search. Well, you know, that networking before you even submit your resume should be the most important piece. Um, you know, the resume is there to to get you an interview, to help you stand out from you know that pile of paper from the other applicants. So <clears throat> it's it's an important piece of the job search for sure, but it's not it's not the most important piece. Making the connection with the employer is the most important more most important part. <laughs> So just to start off with some pointers, and we'll come back to some some more um, in a little bit here. I've all I've already mentioned that first one that a resume should present a clear theme, <clears throat> and ideally, this is done through work experience and education. You know, ideally, you're trying to apply for a job where you already have some experience in the field, and your education is directly relevant to that. You know, that's not always the case, and so. If you're a career changer or if you're going to a field entry level, you know, how do you present a clear theme? Well, you do that through a functional resume that highlights that highlights transferable skills and experiences. Um, and so I will be showing off a, kind of a template, an idea for this in a little bit as well. But the idea is just to highlight, you know, what have I done in the past with each experience that I've had, work experience, volunteer, internship, what within those jobs, which experiences are relevant to the job that I'm trying to obtain? 
Um, full pages versus the old industry rule I talked about and the misconceptions. One of my pointers here is that, sure, a lot of people aren't able to, to get it down to one page, but use all of the space that's that's available to you within those pages. So my point is not one and a half pages, either one or two full pages. Use the space you're taking up. Um, font size is important that it's legible, so it's not too small in order to fit everything down onto one page. Around 10 to 12 is uh, pretty pretty common. Uh, verb tense consistency. So just to be consistent in how your your writer your writing is. So um, you could either write in you know the present tense for every job you've had. You can write in the past tense for um, previous jobs and also have present tense for the current job. That that's fine and in that way you could say it's not necessarily consistent. But it's in order to be consistent in one of those ways. So everything's either past tense or um, everything in the past is past tense and your present job is, is present tense. Dates and locations should also be um, listed consistently. So in whichever way you're listing it on your format. Um, reverse chronological is ideally how you want to list dates. And um, locations just means that for every position, you know, you're remembering to include what city and state you're in. Sometimes if you're submitting a lot of resumes within a region, that you've lived in, you know, for a long time, you forget to list where <laughs> you just make the assumption that everyone knows where that business is. Um, leading in is very important, and this this applies to um, the entire document and also within each section. So your lead into your resume is that top one third physical space of your resume, um, and the reason for that is because a lot of People who will be reviewing your resumes are pulling it up on an electronic device, be it a phone or a tablet or a laptop, and that first third of your um, of that page that you submit is usually the, the space that shows on that electronic device where they're reviewing it. So that's the idea of you know having a nice heading, having a professional summary, and usually that's it. Sometimes you'll see a little bit of the next section. Um, leading in within section, so for your work experience section on your resume. You know, you're listing your title um, and, you know, where it was, the, the dates and your title, and then you start listing some of those, um, some of that content. You should lead in with your, your best selling point there, your most relevant piece of information. Um, your resume header should be, um, have your name and your contact information, and uh, your name should stand apart from your contact information. And you should have, um, at a minimum, four things. So your name, your phone number, your email address, and your unique LinkedIn URL. And that's a, still kind of a new thing for people. Um, not everybody puts that on their resume. Um, and that's because some people haven't created their LinkedIn profiles yet. And so that's something that needs to be done for every job seeker. Um, PDF, so format is important. PDF, submitting in a PDF format tends to have the best results on the uploader side. There seem to be fewer issues with the way your resume looks, so it should look the way you intended it to look. So um, that's my recommendation is to submit in a PDF form. Who should review your resume? Very important point um, is that you should have different eyes look at your resume because you know people like me we don't necessarily have the same within the, within group. We other career counselors, other HR professionals, we don't necessarily have the same opinions about what looks effective on a resume, um, and also especially for content, because the best people to give you um, a review for your resume are the ones that have experience in the areas you're trying to go into, and so you know for me people in education or counseling and psych in psychology, I can give them the best content reviews. Um, that's my background. So for other people, I do the best I can, but it's more about format and aesthetics. So a little bit about resume pointers, and we'll get back to some more. Um, which tools are available to you in order to help develop your resume content? Um, there's the resume coloring book. There is the WSU resume packet. Um, there's the Occupational Outlook Handbook. Uh, you can perform inter, in, uh, informational interviews. And there's also a, a website called wordle.net that simply creates a, world, a word cloud. And I will show you 
um, a little bit from these resources and how to get to them and to give you an idea about how that can be helpful for you. So I'll start with the, um, the resume coloring book, um, ASCC.WSU.edu. That's the um, Academic Success and Career Center for the WSU Pullman campus. And so this um, is where you would go to access the resume coloring book and also the WSU resume packet. So on the uh, drop down menu here on the left side, click on careers. And then scroll down to resumes and cover letters. And then you will see the access point, um, the portal for the resume coloring book right here. Um, and I think you can log in just at the bottom. Nope, you just click on the resume coloring book box to log in. Um, what is it? Why, why should you use it? Um, it's a series. So originally it was a book, and the author um, started kind of transforming it into online modules for, um, you know, higher institution, uh, higher academia. And so um, there are these six online modules. They're about 90 minutes total um, from start to finish. The vast majority of people, you know, you don't do it all in one sitting. I wouldn't recommend you do it all in one sitting because there's going to be a lot of brainstorming um, and a lot of uh, worksheets to fill out along the way to help you develop your resume content, which is the most important part of your resume. Um, so it helps you translate that volunteer experience, internship experience, any kind of leadership experience, both paid and unpaid, into skills and competencies that are valued by employers. Um, it's an action-oriented way of teaching resume writing and resume wording, so it's not just about formatting and aesthetics. It'll talk about different styles of resumes, different types. Um, a lot of people find it difficult to self promote and it helps you, you know, take that self-judgment out of the equation, really focus on your experiences. Uh, focusing on transferable skills um, helps you look at the work you've done, like I said. It has a thing called the ethos method um, where you look at every experience and you break down the tasks within those, um, how you did it, the outcomes and the skills. So that's E-T-H-O-S is their acronym, ethos method. Um, and so you can kind of pick and choose, too, where you want to focus your time as you um, familiarize yourself a little bit with the software. Um, so you don't have to necessarily focus on the formatting part, how to add color, um, but really more about really developing content and brainstorming experiences. This is one of the worksheets, just to give you an idea um, about brainstorming your experience. Looks everything you've done, like I said, all these different kinds of experiences and pull out um, what's relevant from those. So did you make decisions? Did you lead or influence others? Did you handle money? Um, did you Were you in charge of the building? Did you supervise? Were you part of a team? Did you work with customers? So they have these all these little resources like this that you can just take and keep um, so you can keep for future use. Talks about the ethos method, how to write powerful sentences. That's definitely a part of the resume coloring book. Um, Helps you think about things like, did you deal with money or customers? Were you involved in decision making or supervision? Um, it helps you quantify your work. Numbers are very important for resumes. They're very powerful. The eyes are naturally drawn to numbers. So not, not just the quantity of your work, but also the impact of your work, the quality of your work, and the scope of your work environment. So this is really a great tool for developing that content um, of your resume. Also here at um, the ASCC website is that resume packet. And the easiest way to get there is to go, again, on this left-hand menu under Career Services, the helpful links. And on the right side, they have these different information packets. And one that you can see is resume and cover letter. This one is helpful because um, that's good examples. And no matter what, you know, you'll go through things like the resume coloring book, and you'll do these brainstorming activities, and you'll fill, fill out these worksheets. But sometimes you still get stuck. Sometimes you still have a hard time, you know, thinking about different ways to make the language different and still powerful. Um, and sometimes you just need an example. So um, they have examples on, you know, how to think about new ways to word things, questions to ask yourself. 
focusing on non-technical competencies. That's definitely a point um, that I hear a lot from students that I work with. Um, for some students who might be more in the um, the general studies liberal arts side of things, it's really you know they they have a hard time identifying skills that they're learning through their education. But a lot of those are these non-technical competencies, and these are ones that employers have identified as important to them. Um, and there's some written examples here. And again, more just solid examples of things that you can use. And you might, you know, you're not probably not using the things that they're listing here word for word, but it's going to help generate ideas for you. Here's one of those, um, you know, those action word charts, which are helpful. It's helpful to see so you can mix up your language. Um, and so just like a res resume building worksheet. And then I just want to show you some of the examples. So um, this one, I think, is chronological, right? Looks like it. Yep. And it does have that LinkedIn um, URL. And you can see it's, you know, when you create a LinkedIn account, it will be your page will be linkedin.com slash a bunch of random numbers and letters. And there's a way within LinkedIn where you can um, customize it if it's, you know, whatever you want it to be if it's available. So it can look cleaner like this one. Um, as a sample chronological, and that's kind of just like a traditional resume. Here's a functional look. So this one focusing on clinical experience, community experience, and food service experience. Idea, um, you can get a better idea of what this this format looks like. Technical, and I think science also. Science too. I know I'm scrolling quickly. Well, that's a little bit of what that looks like um, on a reference page. References should be on a separate page. This gives you a nice format on how to do that. Okay. And I wanted to show you also the Occupational Outlook Handbook and how you can use this for your resume. This is uh, located at, at www.bls.gov slash OOH. Um, and so Sometimes when you are creating a resume and you're thinking about developing content and how to tailor that for the employer, um, you know, you want to, you look at their job posting. What if there isn't a job posting? You know, how do you use it then? Well, you can go to the Occupational Outlook Handbook or you can conduct an informational interview to get an idea of, you know, what is important within that company, what is important with that industry. So I'm just going to search for a job here. I'll just use something within these groups here on the left side. I'll go healthcare. Um, we'll go audiologists. So for each listing, it'll have a summary of everything. What does an audiologist do is the second tab. What's the work environment like is the third tab. How to become one, what's the pay like, what's the outlook. So this is how it gets its name. Um, audiologists are projected to grow 21% from 2016 to 2026. So that's much faster than the average. Which gives you an idea this is good. Um, generally a good um, career area to pursue for the outlook. So audiologists do. So for each one, they'll list duties. Um, and uh, there's some different sections for different job listings that kind of break it down for different types. So for this one, there's only they're saying there's only this one type of audiologist. But for other areas, it'll break it down into you know what are different responsibilities for different types of that career. But what I'm going to do is copy and paste. Uh, these duties. Okay, so I'm copying. And now I'm going to show you Wordle.net, which I mentioned, is just a word cloud generator. Um, and so just to show you what this is like, I'm going to click Create My Own. I'm pasting it in there, and I'm going to click Go. And it's going to create a word cloud for me. And it always likes to do it in a layout that's difficult to read. <laughs> so I'll switch it here under layout, the horizontal. And I don't love this font either. There we go, much easier to read. So it just does kind of, um, a, it randomizes the layout and the font, but you can change those very easily. So um, this is a kind of like a little trick, and it doesn't always work. But if you're trying to think of a way to kind of tailor your resume, 
look at information on you know a professional organization on the occupational outlook handbook to give you an idea of things to to focus on so for audiologists obviously there's going to be a lot of you know patient experience what kind of treatment experience do you have obviously knowledge of hearing in the ear what's your you know your educational background um, um, what kind of data experience you have with measuring hearing loss, working with implants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just this is just an example I totally just pulled out from a random search. Um, so yeah, that's an idea of how you can use information online uh, about a certain career area in order to provide resume content, to build resume content. Another uh, brainstorming thing that you can do. So uh, just some ideas on how you can use resources. Also, informational interview. Um, I talk about these in most of my webinars. It's just um, conversations you arrange with people who have knowledge and experience in, pro in a profession that you wish to investigate. Um, it's used by profession professionals to research advancement opportunities, as well as career changers or people looking to enter the field. So it helps you to gain insight and information from a personal account of the work setting, um, knowledge and skill requirements, and current trends. Um, develop your networking skills and introduce yourself to people. Um, help you identify how to pre prepare yourself for that particular career goal and also increase motivation in doing so. And so if you want more information on um, informational interviews, you can just send me an email and I can share that with you too. But these are all great resources you have um, at your fingertips to help you develop that resume content, which is the most important part. So under your work experience, you know, it should be a mix of duties, responsibilities, skills, um, you developed accomplishments. That is the, the most important part of your resume. Common mistakes. And so like a lot of these things, common mistakes are the opposite of the tips. <laughs> so a common mistake being, you know, not listing your LinkedIn URL in the, in the, um, the heading, um, not focusing on the strong lead-in, um, uh, not listing a professional summary, um, having a professional summary that's too vague or off point. The same thing with an objective. Um, objectives should be short and sweet, and they're also kind of outdated. And not everyone agrees on this, but I, d I personally don't re recommend using an objective. I'd, I'd say you should probably use that space to focus on a professional summary. Um, being too long or too short, it lacks an appropriate format, usually just messiness or um, you know, it's too bland because someone hasn't decided how they want to go about presenting their their information. Um, using full sentences, using full paragraphs, that's definitely something we haven't talked about, something you want to avoid. You want to stick to bullets and phrasing, um, typos, only listing duties, um, and including references. So just some little things that are mostly just the opposite of those pointers. Uh, briefly, just addressing cover cover letters. Cover letters should be fairly simple. Um, whenever you have the opportunity to provide one with a resume, you sh I recommend doing it, as long as it's just not you're doing it for the sake of repetition. Um, so the idea is to, to pull out some information, some content from your resume, and kind of expand on it. Um, it should be in a letter format. I can show you a, a format of what it looks like. Um, you should try to address a specific person at the company. You should have done that that pre-contact work, and not list to, to whom it may concern. You know, sometimes you can't do that, and I understand, but you should really put in the effort to find who is going to be looking at your resume. Um, you should introduce yourself, reference the position, and how you found it. Um, elaborate, like I said, on your qualifications, and if you can, if there's an open listing, you know, trying to hit on some points from that. Um, requesting a meeting and thanking them for their time. So let me share that resume packet again has um, a sample cover letter. Breaking down the cover letter and what you should do in the first paragraph, second paragraph, and third paragraph. And again, this is a letter, so it's not saying to list bullet, bullet, bullet. Um, it's just saying that these are different points that are important for, for each section of your cover letter. And here's one. Here's a sample. That's another thing you can review to get an idea of what an effective cover letter might look like. And you know, sometimes it's an afterthought. Um, some employers don't care. They just want your resume, and they'll say, you know, just your resume. But if you have an opportunity to provide more information, I, I think it's one you should really take. Hopefully, you've had time to see um, this job 
this mock job posting and um, the applicants. I know it's outdated, um, so don't you know? Don't pay too much attention to the dates. I don't have the original copy, so I couldn't amend. I can't make edits, unfortunately. Um, so you know, it's a mock. It's just these are mock candidates and a mock employer uh, posting. I'll go over the posting quickly, and then we'll take a look at these at these um, applicants and you know replicants which one do you feel is the best fit some questions to ask yourself as you're looking at them um, why do you feel some resumes are more effective than others uh, do you see any red flags and you know who would you interview uh, you know there if there are four of them here let's say which two of them would you interview and you can write your answers in the chat box I'll just kind of go over my thoughts um, about them and provide kind of a brief overview of, the, of this posting and um, and these candidates. So let me share that. So here's our company ProLab. They're looking for a marketing assistant. And as you can see, they have a wide um, swath of, uh, of products or of um, targets here. They, they focus on telecommunications, computer, and hair care products. And they're seeking a marketing assistant. Um, looking for someone to develop, uh, assist in the development and implementation of strategic and tactical marketing programs for their key products. Um, they want someone to coordinate project initiatives in support of uh, major product marketing programs, assess current product opportunities, and determine the viability and maintenance of product categories, um, collaborate with Salesforce on new products and uh, features and benefits, coordinate copy developments or writing copy, uh, assemble and assess category and brand review data. There's that word data. Uh, monitoring uh, marketing budgets monthly with the uh, senior marketing execs. Um, let me go ahead and pan down here. The requirements uh, requires a bachelor's degree in marketing or a related field or equivalent experience. Minimum of one year experience in a business environment, marketing, I should say. Uh, skills in product management, brand management, PR, journalism, advertising, sales, and our product development. Um, possess strong communication skills to inspire and lead peers and instill confidence within the organization. Effective conflict resolution skills while maintaining the ability to challenge thoughts and ideas. Strong execution skills, detail oriented. Analytical project management skills, multitasking, working in a fast-paced environment, uh, proficient with Microsoft Office, and self-driven, high energy, and uh, dedicated work ethics. So that's just giving you an idea of this mock posting for a marketing assistant that ProLab is looking for. So some of the things that I see, and I can't copy and paste this into Wordle, but I'm seeing a lot of um, you know project management, of course, marketing experience. Um, things that they've developed and implemented, so different um, strategies that have kind of come, that they've started from from cradle to grave, um, product experience, writing copy, uh, working with sales, reviewing data, so any kind of data analytics experience they have, um, budgeting work, um, education or relevant experience in marketing, PR, product management, brand management, journalism, advertising. So these are kind of those keywords that they're looking for with this one. Some of the things that you would hope an applicant would be focusing on. But first, we're going to start with Gabriel. And I see, um, like I said, these are older. So there's not going to be any LinkedIn um, uh, information in their contact information. But we'll go ahead and ignore that for the time being. And we'll ignore the dates for the most part. Um, you don't have to list, so with contact information nowadays, you don't have to list physical address. Address You can just list your phone number, your email address, um, your name, of course, and that LinkedIn. So, But he has, he has his phone number and his email address. Um, he has a really long objective. And an objective should be short and sweet, clear and concise. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm looking at this as a career counselor right now, not necessarily as that employer. So from an employer's point of view, you know, this is a one-page resume, so maybe it's okay. Um, I wouldn't really call this section an objective. It's more like a professional summary. So maybe a simple retitling would help there. Um, so in looking at the format, they're, they're going from objective to experience and education 
second. And so um, thinking of leading in, I would say, um, what is your experience now? It's, it's retail sales specialist. It's not necessarily marketing. Um, sales is it is something I would say is is rel can be construed as relevant, um, depending on the specific experience. But the education down here shows uh, a degree in marketing. So in terms of the lead in and being strategic, I would probably go professional summary here and then education and then experience. And of course, within education, the lead-in is important. They're starting with a certi certification and then the bachelor's degree. Well, that's a two-week um, sales training certificate, which isn't super relevant to marketing. So I would lead, flip that, you're gonna wanna lead with your bachelor's degree and then have the certification underneath it. Um, so that's one of the things I see. There's great data. I'm seeing the numbers pop out right now met or surpassed sales expectation each month for two consecutive years, averaged 120% of quota in a given year, ranked number one out of 15, sold to 900 plus customers. So that's great information for a resume. Um, so he has relevant experience. Um, he has relevant education. You would say, you know, his experience, mm, it might be relevant. I would consider, I would consider Gabriel based on those. Um, he has some affiliations listed here about a professional association. Um, I really like how he li he's listing his skill level for skills. Um, so telecommunication, telecom sales expert level, uh, working with a CRM expert level, working with Microsoft Office intermediate. Um, and additional information, you know, He's kind of, well, languages. So that's one of the quirky things that I you wouldn't really need to have on here. This isn't an international posting. Um, and so you don't really need to list that you're fully fluent in English. That's um, unnecessary information. I like his additional information here at the bottom. High energy sales professional um, uh, with a proven track record of sales, and that's backed up you know, with these bullets here, or these stars about how he's ranked number one out of 15, 120% uh, of, um, of the quota. But this seems kind of repetitive to me, this additional information section. It could be something you could combine with objective, replace as the objective, or um, kind, of, kind of flush that out more in a cover letter. But overall, it, I think it has a nice format. It, it flows fairly well, um, and you know I'm keeping Gabriel in my in my stack. Uh, Miranda, the heading looks nice with the name standing apart from the contact information. That objective is very short and sweet. Um, I would say you want it to be clear and concise, and they got the concise part down, but not the clear. Um, so that would need some work. Leading with education suggests that maybe you don't have any experience. Um, but then looking at the employment, there there is relevant marketing experience. It's just as an internship. So I do understand why she um, this person's leading with education first. So I'm OK with that. But you know, as a career counselor, what you want to do is kind of make this part stand out. This all kind of runs together here. So you know, this Bachelor of Arts International Business and Marketing using some kind of bolded font, italicized font, undersized, underlined font, just to help that stand out. Putting on my employer hat again. Um, you know, that's, that's great education employment. There's four years of this internship, and I know as an intern, this person's not working. So I'm ignoring the specific dates, but there's a four-year gap here uh, of employment as a marketing intern. Um, and I know this person's, it's an internship, they're not working full time, but three bullets is very little, and there's really not a lot of information there. Um, so that is a concern for me. Um, a resident advisor, moving on, and sales associate below that. Again, not a lot of information. There's a lot of white space on this resume. Um, relevant computer skills are listed, but again, this is just mostly an expansion of Microsoft Office skills. Um, 
interest being ice hockey and limericks, I, that's interesting to me. So although it piques my curiosity, I don't know if this one would, would be in my, my pile. Moving to Farley. Um, Farley has, does, has done well with his name, standing apart from the contact information, but there's no email address, which is not even for the time. Um, seeking an entry-level position in sales or marketing, that is definitely not something you'd want to see. You'd say, why isn't that just say marketing? Um, and also marketing for ProLab. <coughs> Education, uh, BA in, in communications with a public, public relations PR major. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's not marketing, but that's very relevant. Um, where it is, everything looks good there. Uh, so leading with education over experience. You know, the experience is specific. Again, switching hats to career counselor. Uh, is it, It's sales and marketing rep, and then a marketing assistant below that. So I don't know. For this one, I would consider leading with experience over education. Um, this is an example of someone who left left off location. So they're taking the assumption that I know where Lon's computing system is, and I know where Broadway Master Theater is, which is not necessarily the case. Um, that first line under Lon's, applied marketing skills to increase sales of, of old G3 computers. Well, that's good information, but where's the data? Where are the numbers to back that up? Um, honors and interests are all are all helpful um, selling points, you know. But again, with the leading thought, lead in thought, I might lead with that award over senior honors um, for that specific award for communications. I mean, this isn't, you know, I would say this is this is good because of the, you know, we don't have a lot of information about the time under these dates. Um, again, we're ignoring the specific year, but from when to when, what is that timeline? But this person seems to have relevant education and directly relevant work experience. So I'm considering Farley. Mr. Anderson here has the longest one. Um, it is running over a page. And it's doing so in a way that seems unnecessary to me. You could take off references. And what's that leave? Uh, uh, one, two, three, maybe five or six lines of bullets here that you would have to cut back to fit this all into one page. I see an easy way you could do that right now. Objective to obtain a marketing position in a corporation. <laughs> um, so that's that's very that's very bland. Um, again, concise but not clear. So I would say cut that and then under honors and activities, make this two columns instead of one column and there you go, you have a one page resume. Um, again, that's my career counselor hat. Uh, education, I'm leading with the education, so probably not a lot of direct experience with marketing, but maybe there is. Um, major, uh, a marketing major, so that's that's fine. Looks good. Leading with honors and awards over work experience, that's not something I would recommend as a career counselor, unless it's like in a professional summary section and it's very relevant at the top. Um, Work experience, it kind of, it's interesting how they listed it runs together. My career counseling at University Hallmark Oxford, so it's not really separating the business from the location. This all looks like one, one name instead of it being in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, and looking at these bullets, you know, there's not, there's sales, there's a lot of sales, which I, again is partially relevant, is somewhat relevant. You can make that argument. And sales is a part of the marketing assistant piece. But for me, I don't know, there's just not a lot of very super relevant information compared to, I would say, Farley and Gabriel. So for me, I'm thinking about Farley and Gabriel. So hopefully you're able to, to work through some of these questions as you are looking at, um, as you are looking at these candidates in this mock job posting for the marketing assistant. I know it's, you know, it's hard, even with these mock candidates, I feel, <laughs> like, I, you know, I want to interview everybody, but I you know, can't always do that. So um, based on those reasons of education and experience, those are the two, Gabriel and Farley, I think, are the two that I would select. Okay. I think that 
brings us to the end here for the question and answer segment. Um, before I end, I do want to say thank you, and I will stick around for questions. I've listed my contact information there. Um, cmiller66 at wsu.edu is the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, and there's information about the career support website at online.wsu.edu, and also the WSU Career Guide blog that I try to do a posting about every week. And you know, right now it's going to be information about these kind of events. And also, um, I, this is a good time to point out that I will be at Rendezvous this Saturday. So hopefully, if you're in the area and you have a resume that you would like me to look at and to give some feedback specifically um, for you, that would be great. Send me an email and let's. Um, and you know, let's set up a time to to go over your resume. So thanks again. I will stick around for questions now. Thank you, Chris. Our first question asks: Do you always provide a cover letter, or only when requested? That's a good question. I, if they don't say anything about a cover letter, then I would provide one. Because usually, when they don't want one, they'll say resume only. Do not submit a cover letter. So. I say, you know, always take that opportunity to provide more information. Um, if you're in a position where, you know, you've been working at it for a long time and you just can't seem to find any um, way to provide more detail than your resume has, then maybe it's not a good idea. But in most instances, I would say it's, it's, you know, another opportunity to let them know a little bit more about yourself and your experience. Our next question asks. Why shouldn't you provide references on a resume? Would you put references available upon request, or you just need to not address it at all? I would say, yeah, I would say don't address it at all. It's kind of um, this bargaining chip idea um, is that, you know, they're, the vast majority of employers are not going to be concerned with calling anyone's references until they're ready to make a job offer. And they're not going to do that until they've interviewed you. Um, so, what you want to do is, I, you know, most people would make no reference to it whatsoever, and all it does is, if you put it available upon request, it just takes up space on your resume. Um, and so, you know, that's something they're going to do after they've met you. They they can ask for references, or you know, if you submit a resume, um, they might ask you for references at the same time, and then you would do it. But if there's no mention of it, you know, don't do it. Thanks, Chris. Um, the next question asks, would you include scholarships in a resume? Yeah, I mean, if you have um, if you have the space for it, and absolutely, um, it's an honor and an award. So if there's an honor and award section, you could do that. If you don't have that, you could you could make a case that you could fit it in nicely into the education section. Um, you know, a lot of people list their degree and then they list you know relevant coursework below that major um, that degree. So you could definitely find a way to do that, to do it within the education section or within an honor and award section. Our next question asks, some jobs are better for numerical examples on a resume. What if your experience has less numbers to back it up? For example, a teaching assistant or a nanny and no hard numbers like sales experience or marketing experience? Yeah, I, I mean, that's when I would really recommend the resume coloring book because they have different ways to quantify your work experience uh, and other ways to think beyond just numbers um, and other ways that are creative ways to use numbers too. So that's when I would really recommend um, diving into that resource and finding different ways to quantify your experience. That's a good question and it's, you know, I can't, it's very difficult for me to specifically answer it um, without seeing their resume, but um, I would definitely recommend that resource for that specific issue. Thanks, Chris. Our next question asks, are one inch margins necessary for a resume? No. Um, and again, if you take a look at some of the examples from the, the resume coloring book, or if you even just do a Google search, um, you know, let me do a, a quick Google search. I'll, I'll share my screen here um, just to show you some resume formats of what's common now. Um, it's not necessary at all. It, you know, it just has to be something that is easy to scan through. Um, and you know, as long as it doesn't look like a huge block that's taking up everything, it's not necessary. Let me just do just a quick um, search here. Resume, resume format. There it is. 
So as you kind of start to look, um, these barns aren't even as artistic as you'll see nowadays. I'm surprised, but you'll see start to see things with more color. If you can pop these out as easily, um, you'll start to see things that have lots of very vari uh, variation with the margins. Look at this one specifically. Um, oh, it doesn't want me to do it. Okay. Oh, no. You know the margin is very different with something like this. Um, there's all these. You know you can look at a lot of different formats online. Um, so just to give you an idea that you know there's really no wrong or right way to submit a format. It it should just be something because you know you got to think about the other side of the table. You present the same resume to you know five different companies in the same industry, and you're not going to get the same response. So um, it really should just be something that looks good that conveys the message. Um, Jump over. Conveys the message, and um, is something that works for you. Something you think that looks good that you've asked other people. They think it looks good. Um, there are so many different ways to to format a resume. There's not, you know, there just aren't specific ways it should be done now. As long as it's you know following some of those pointers that we've talked about. That was a very long answer. I know. <laughs> Excellent. Um, our last question for right now asks, what is the difference between a professional summary and an objective? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, so an objective is short and sweet, like like the ones we were looking at for these mock resume posts or these mock job posting. Um, so you know something where it says a junior marketing or uh, to obtain a marketing position at ProLab utilizing my skills in so and so. That's an objective. It's just short and sweet. Um, and I would say most resume professionals now say, don't even don't even focus on that. Um, take that off and just do a professional summary. It's something that pulls together important pieces of your experience um, in a neat like a like on a, a research paper. It would have, you know, uh, the abstract up front at the top. It's kind of like an idea to think of it. So, if you if you have that ability to to look at the job posting and kind of see what they're looking, what they're trying to get out of an applicant, and kind of specifically address those by highlighting your qualifications. So a professional summary is just that. It's saying, you know, I have this many years in this industry. Um, I have the proficient skill level and this and this and this that they are looking for. Um, and you kind of you can you can have a, a little text block, or you can have like a couple columns of bullet points. Um, and again, the resume coloring book will help you focus on a professional summary. Um, and you can see different formats that have different ways of doing that. And again, I'm speaking, I know, very generally. Um, but that's that's basically the difference is it's more tailored. It's a better way of tailoring your experience um, with a specific posting and kind of presenting a neat introduction. <laughs>